Dear comrades, first of all, I wish to convey warmest greetings of international and anti-imperialist solidarity and proletarian internationalism, and to thank you for inviting me to speak about the Philippine situation in the context of May 1st, the International Day of the Proletariat. Because Philippine society is semi-colonial and semi-feudal, the Communist Party of the Philippines, as the vanguard of the proletariat, has adopted as general line of program the People's Democratic Revolution with a socialist perspective. The socialist stage of the Philippine Revolution can commence upon the basic completion of the People's Democratic Revolution through the seizure of political power by the proletariat in a protracted people's war. The semi-colonial and semi-feudal ruling system in the Philippines is an ever-worsening chronic socio-economic and political crisis because three monsters, imperialism, feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism are always sucking blood and sweat from the toiling masses of workers and peasants. All these monsters have been favored by the U.S. instigated policy of neoliberalism under the dogma of unbridled private greed of the monopoly bourgeoisie as the chief motive force for wealth creation in opposition to the truth that labor power creates wealth. The basic lines of operation of the three monsters are as follows. Imperialism keeps the country underdeveloped in order to take super profits from the export of cheap raw materials, agricultural products and semi-manufacturers, importing higher price manufactured and luxury products for the exploiting classes, and providing the onerous loans to cover the perennial trade deficits. Feudalism in the form of landlord-tenant relations is predominant in the countryside because so many bogus land reform programs and development of a certain amount of semi-feudal relations. In the absence of national industrial development, bourgeois land reform programs have always retrogressed to the revival of traditional feudalism in old and new settlements. Bureaucrat capitalism is what characterizes the highest officials of the reactionary state who use their offices to accumulate private wealth in the form of bureaucrat capital in bank deposits and urban property as well as in big comprador enterprises and agricultural land holdings. The favorite methods of corruption by bureaucrat capitalists include the so-called pork barrel in infrastructure projects, cutting into private contracts, government purchases of equipment, and the like. In all the years that he is president, Duterte has followed the policy dictates of the U.S. government. The multilateral financial institutions and foreign credit rating agencies as well as the promptings of the, the local American Chamber of Commerce and the local big comprador partners. These are in line with expanding the interests of the U.S. and other foreign big banks and corporations and local big bourgeois compradors, big landlords and the bureaucrat capitalists. The economic policies adopted by subservient regimes have caused the Philippine economy to stagnate and remain underdeveloped agrarian, semi-feudal, and non-industrial. Production remains import-dependent, export-oriented, and debt-burdened due to trade and budgetary deficits. Limited industrial production is low value added and involves mainly the assembly of imported components or packaging. Agriculture remains largely small-scale, employing hand tools and very limited use of machinery. Under the Duterte regime, the ruling system has become even more rotten and unable to address the needs of the Filipino people who suffer from a high rate of unemployment, grossly low wages, loss of income, landlessness, and land grabbing, rising prices, grave lack of or inadequacy of social services and education, health and public housing, and other serious social ills. The regime has bankrupted the economy and has sunk into deeper crisis. In less than six years, the public debt doubled from 
5.9 trillion pesos in 2016 to more than 12 trillion uh, pesos last March and is expected to rise further to 13.42 trillion pesos by end of this year. Large-scale corruption, wasteful and anomalous infrastructure projects, and military overspending have bankrupted the government, resulting in record levels of deficit spending reaching a high of 1.67 trillion pesos last year. The traitor Lieutenant regime has allowed the foreign monopoly firms and banks to tighten their control and expand their domination of the local economy through amendments of the Foreign Investments Act, the Retail Trade Liberalization Act, and the Public Service Act, which all circumvent and violate the categorical limits in the 1987 Constitution against full foreign ownership and operation of businesses. These laws allow the imperialists to fully own and operate enterprises in all fields of investments, except defense certain public utilities, such as distribution of electricity and water, and in smaller retail trade. He has enacted the rice import liberalization law in order to flood the domestic market with imported state-subsidized rice, and to harm the interests of rice farmers who have suffered from the low buying price of rice set by the government. Vegetable farmers and meat producers are also being subjected to unfair competition by rampant smuggling under the cover of all-out liberalization. He has expanded the business privileges of the foreign monopoly firms and has reduced their taxes, but under the Tax Reform for Acceleration and Inclusion Law, he has required the people to shoulder onerous excise taxes on commodities and services. It is at the expense of the poor consumers and working people that he seeks to cover the mounting debts and revenue losses due to tax cuts in favor of foreign and big company corporations. As bureaucrat capitalists, they use their power to accumulate ill-gotten wealth. Corruption continues to worsen in the form of kickbacks and bribes in exchange for government favors and state-related contracts and white elephant projects that are reminiscent of and comparable to the wasteful infrastructure spending under the 14-year Marcos dictatorship. Many of these graph-laden bridges, coastal roads, and land reclamation are unnecessary and take away the source of living of peasants and fisher folk. The Filipino people have suffered greatly from Duterte's overspending on the military and police for the purchase of overpriced surplus military equipment from the U.S. and to raise above standard the salaries of officers of the armed forces of the Philippines and Philippine National Police in order to buy their loyalty. It is now a big problem for the finance officers of the reactionary government to raise the yearly amount of 800 billion pesos to maintain the salary increases for uniformed personnel and upward adjustment of their pensions. Due to military overspending and corruption, public education, public health and other social services have suffered from lack of funding and from drastic budgetary cuts. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the gross shortage of doctors, nurses, and medical workers in public hospitals and high costs of laboratory tests and treatment and brought to light the family racket and scandal in which Duterte, his mistress Sanilet, and his valet Bongo have rechanneled to their private pockets tens of billions of pesos from the national budget for the public health campaign against COVID-19. Right now, the broad masses of the people, especially the workers and peasants, are overburdened by displacement from work and the rising prices of fuel, food, and other basic commodities and utilities, while big comprador companies rake in gargantuan profits. Under Duterte, the toiling masses have suffered from wage repression and wage cuts, which can no longer cover the daily cost of living of the majority of Filipino families. The exploitation and expression of 
oppression of workers are intensified through short-term job contracting, other flexible labor arrangements, and outright dismissals. Millions of jobless people are desperately cramped in large shanty towns and cities. In the countryside, rampant land use conversion and land grabbing by big landlords, mining companies, infrastructure projects, and expansion of plantations have forced the displacement of hundreds of thousands of peasants from the land. All in all, up to 70% of Filipino Filipinos precariously live on or below the poverty threshold. It is preposterous that the Duterte regime and its followers still boast that the Bongbong Bong Marcos Duterte tandem and slate of crooks and butchers are so popular that they will win the 2022 elections. They can do so only through fraud and terrorism. The Filipino people abhor the Duterte regime for its treasonous, tyrannical, brutal, and corrupt rule. They perceive and detest Marcos presidential candidate and um, Duterte, Sara Duterte, the vice presidential candidate, as the combination of the worst of the political dynasties that have ruled the Philippines. The Duterte regime is extremely isolated, but Duterte's lust for power knows no bounds, especially because he wishes to avoid prosecution for his crimes against humanity before the International Criminal Court, for crimes of plunder before the courts of his own state, and for his crimes of counter-revolution before the people's court. His scheme to use the Marcos Duterte tandem to avoid criminal accountability has heightened contradictions among rival factions of the big comprador landlord ruling class. He is hell-bent on rigging the 2022 elections in favor of the Marcos Duterte tandem and slave, and he is inclined to declare nationwide martial law supposedly to preempt the disruption of the electoral process and ensure a seamless transition to his chosen successors. But this will certainly incite widespread mass protest and cause further instability of the ruling system. Mass rallies being mobilized by the main political opposition party and the progressive forces continue to grow large, disprove the false claims of popular support for Duterte and his candidates and indicate the victory of the Robredo, Pangilinan tandem and slate. There is certainty, or at least high probability, that Duterte will rig the vote count and even declare martial law in the remainder of his term in May and June to declare martial law. But the huge mass rallies being mobilized by the opposition, the churches, and the legal democratic forces can still dissuade or prevent him from committing electoral fraud and declaring martial law. But of course, U.S. imperialism and its Central Intelligence Agency and Defense Intelligence Agency operatives and assets within the reactionary armed forces will provide the puppet Duterte with the most weighty advice. Whatever the outcome of the May elections, the broad masses of the Filipino people are determined to continue with their struggles to assert defend and promote the national and democratic rights and aspirations. They can rise up to overthrow the usurpers of political power as swiftly as in 1986 after the Marcos fascist dictatorship rigged the elections or they must wage a relentless struggle for a longer period of time just to overthrow the usurpers. At any rate, they must contend with and resist state terrorism and the high degree of militarization of the reactionary state. Despite the attempts of the Duterte regime to sell out the sovereign rights of the Filipino people to China in the West Philippine Sea and to lure China to extend a loan of $24 billion for infrastructure projects, the U.S. remains the dominant imperialist power in the Philippines and retains command and control over the puppet reactionary armed forces. It has used the reactionary state and its coercive apparatuses to impose imperialist and fascist power over the Philippine people. The puppet reactionary armed forces and police follow 
U.S. counterinsurgency doctrine, despite its repeated failures and defeats elsewhere in the world. The U.S. provides military indoctrination, training, intelligence, military supplies by grants and credit sales within the frame of the Mutual Defense Treaty, the Visiting Forces Agreement, the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, and its Operation Pacific Eagle Philippines. U.S. troops, military equipment, and weapons are pr permanently stationed in the uh, camps of the armed forces and elsewhere in the Philippines alongside China Telecom Towers. To enhance its command and control over the uh, reactionary armed forces, the U.S. has conducted more than 1,300 bilateral military activities in the Philippines and docked their warships at least 850 times over the past six years. Despite the attempts of the Duterte regime to sell out the sovereign rights of the Filipino people to China in the West Philippine Sea and to lure China to extend a loan of $24 billion for infrastructure projects, the U.S. remains the dominant imperialist power in the Philippines and retains command and control over the puppet reactionary armed forces. It has used the reactionary state and its coercive apparatuses to impose imperialist and fascist power over the Filipino people. The puppet reactionary armed forces and police follow U.S. counterinsurgency doctrine despite its repeated failures and defeats elsewhere in the world. The U.S. provides military indoctrination, training, intelligence, military supplies, by grants and credit sales within the frame of the Mutual Defense Treaty, the Visiting Forces Agreement, the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, and its Operation Pacific Eagle Philippines. U.S. troops, military equipment, and weapons are pr permanently stationed in the uh, camps of the armed forces and elsewhere in the Philippines alongside China Telecom Towers. To enhance its command and control over the uh, reactionary armed forces, the U.S. has conducted more than 1,300 bilateral military activities in the Philippines and docked their warships at least 850 times over the past six years. Under the direction, planning, and funding of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, Defense Intelligence Agency, and openly known American military advisors, in the U.S. Army Military Advisory Group, the Philippine reactionary state has brazenly adopted fascist policies, militarized the bureaucracy, suppre suppressed civil liberties and human rights, and unleashed brutal attacks, including abductions, torture, assassinations, and massacres. They have put counterinsurgency and anti-communist suppression in the center of state policy. They have enlarged the power of the military and police under the so-called anti-terror law of 2020. The bureaucracy has been reorganized to place civilian state agencies under the control of the Anti-Terrorism Council and National Task Force, ELCA. These constitute a civil military junta that actually commands the entire government. Violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms by the military and police have run rampant both in the cities and rural areas. Labor unionists, community organizers, youth and women activists, as well as human rights advocates, progressive religious leaders, teachers and health workers have been subjected to surveillance, red tagging, harassment, arbitrary arrest and extrajudicial killings. The situation is even worse in the countryside gross and systematic violations of human rights by the military and police are underreported by reactionary government agencies and corporate media. Entire villages or clusters of villages are placed under military rule, bringing about a climate of terror and hardships on the peasant masses. AFP detachments turn civilian structures into barracks deploy perimeter guards to hamper people's movements, set up checkpoints to control commerce under the pretext of stopping the NPA's food supplies.
prevent them from going to their farms and the forest and obstructing production on the false claim that the extra harvest will go to the NPA. The troops and police incessantly harassed the peasant masses, arbitrarily accused them of supporting the revolutionary movement, make them sign attendance sheets and meetings and make them pose on camera as surrenderees, subject them to surveillance, conduct night raids in their homes, force them to disaffiliate from their legal community organizations, abduct or arrest people on false charges and murder peasant leaders and activists. There are now 166 combat battalions of Army, Air Force, Marines, Scout Rangers, PNP Special Action Forces and other military and police units deployed against the NPA, 21 more than the previous year. The AFP conducts large-scale and focused military operations, coordinate its various branches and make full use of the whole range of its arsenal against the guerrilla forces of the NPA. But at any given time, the AFP and the PNP cannot cover and control more than 20% of the Philippine population and terrain, despite huge military overspending. Duterte's budget for the military further increased to 221 billion pesos this year from 217 billion pesos last year. Despite questionable spending, the budget of the uh, National Task Force ELCA further increased to 17.5 billion pesos from 4.2 billion pesos, although 10 billion pesos is categorized as, as unallocated. Most of the public money being allocated for state terrorism is actually the, the object of massive corruption by the Duterte ruling cliques and a handful of military and police top brass, especially through overpriced payments for domestic and foreign supplies. Even then, in the past six years, the AFP has received a total of $1.14 billion worth of military assistance in the form of foreign military financing, military training programs, and others. The Duterte regime has spent hundreds of billions of pesos to purchase attack and combat utility helicopters, jet fighters and attack aircraft, cannons and artillery systems, 500-pound and 250-pound bombs, rockets and missiles, drone systems, tanks, armored personnel carriers, electronic surveillance and communications equipment, rifles, ammunition, and so on. The U.S. has provided GPS tracking systems button-sized cameras to track guerrilla movement in forested areas, equipment for cell phone surveillance, and so on. It has trained AFP personnel to enhance their cyber warfare capabilities in internal communication systems, real-time monitoring of the battlefield, and improved command capability and mobilization of forces. It directs AFP to control the information environment, so-called, through psyops and disinformation, and to mount cyber attacks against the websites of the CPB and NDFB, and other patriotic and progressive websites that are critical of the Duterte regime. The AFP tries vainly to politically undermine the revolutionary movement by parading surrenderies and corpses and claiming that they were deceived by promises of a better life, by criminalizing revolutionary forces through lawfare, so-called, and making repeated fake news of receiving information from civilians against operating NPA units. It unleashes campaigns to glorify the AFP through tokenistic and palliative livelihood or housing projects and misrepresents infrastructure projects and social services of civilian agencies as those of the military. But by far the atrocities inflicted by the reactionary armed forces and police on the people outstrip the hypocritical attempts to win the hearts and minds of the people. The coercive apparatuses of the reactionary state cannot be but instruments of the gross and systematic violations of human rights. The main drive of the Duterte regime is to try in vain 
to destroy the revolutionary movement of the people and whip up fascist brutality, guarantees impunity, and emboldens the violation of the people's democratic rights and freedoms. The evil purpose is to preserve the ruling system and serve the interests of U.S. imperialism and the local exploiting classes. State forces have wantonly committed crimes against the people, including the massacre of civilians, the abduction, torture, and murder of activists, as well as unarmed revolutionaries and even peace consultants of the National Democratic Front of the Philippines, aerial bombing and shelling of civilian communities, and so on. The number of political prisoners who languish in jail for prolonged periods continue to rise, despite the priority given by the regime to the murder of suspected revolutionaries. As I have pointed out at the beginning, the Communist Party of the Philippines is the advanced detachment of the proletarian. It is guided by the theory of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and applies it on the concrete co practice of the Philippine Revolution. It leads the people's democratic revolution through protracted people's war. It builds the party branches and party committees at all levels of the NPA and the revolutionary mass organizations and at all territorial levels nationwide. It is a general membership of more than 150,000. The People's Democratic Revolution has persevered for so long and has grown in strength. It is invincible because the party keeps on raising the level of revolutionary consciousness and practice of party cadres and members, commanders and fighters of the NPA, and auxiliary forces. The activists of the revolutionary mass organizations, revolutionary alliances, and the officers and personnel of the People's Democratic Government. The party wields as main weapon the armed struggle waged by the NPA in order to smash the state power of the counter-revolutionary class and establish the organs of political power which now constitute the People's Democratic Government. It also wields the National United Front built by the National Democratic Front in order to win the active support of the Filipino people in their millions and prepare the higher levels of the People's Democratic Government. The National United Front involves the basic alliance of the working class and the peasantry, winning over the petty and middle bourgeoisie and taking advantage of the splits among the reactionaries in order to isolate and destroy the power of the enemy, be it the worst reactionary faction in the civil war or the foreign aggressor in the war of national liberation. The anti-feudal United Front policy of the party is important because it is at the foundation of the National United Front, with armed struggle as a main form of struggle being carried out by the NPA. It involves the party relying mainly on the masses of poor peasants and farm workers, winning over the middle peasants, neutralizing the rich peasants, taking advantage of the contradictions between the enlightened and evil gentry, and isolating and destroying the power of the loyal feudal tyrants. The NPA has enjoyed the wide and deep-going support of the peasant masses because they have been a decisive factor in the implementation of genuine land reform from the minimum to the maximum program and have courageously and have indefatigably defended the people against the feudal and semi-feudal tyrants and the fascist onslaughts of the AFP and PNP under the Duterte and previous regimes. The NPA has thousands of red commanders and fighters and is reinforced by the People's Militia, consisting of the local guerrillas, the self-defense units of the revolutionary mass organizations. It aims to go through the probable stages of development in protracted people's war, which include the strategic defensive, with the guerrilla warfare as the main form of warfare, the strategic stalemate with regular mobile warfare, and the strategic offensive combining mobile warfare and positional warfare against the final holdouts of the AFP. The NPA is now carrying out intensive and extensive guerrilla warfare on the flanks and rear of enemy forces to annihilate enemy units and seize their weapons. It launches back-to-back -back 
interfront or inter sub regional tactical offensives in order to make the enemy bleed from a thousand cuts and to deliver periodic blows to its head and uh, special tactical offensives along the enemy's main lines of transportation and communications. It mobilizes the militia units to maintain internal security, smash the enemy's intelligence network, gather intelligence, draw a complete map of the enemy's positions, and help in the plan to deliver effective blows on the enemy. It strives to disable the enemy's communication system, target the enemy's air assets, and punish the fascist criminal bosses. It sabotages the capabilities of the enemy wherever possible and carries out punitive measures against vulnerable enemy units and elements in order to render justice to their victims and compel the enemy to go on the defensive where ne wherever possible and reduce the number of enemy forces arrayed against the guerrilla fronts. The NPA strengthens itself politically and militarily it has a clear plan to recruit thousands upon thousands of red fighters from among the toiling masses of workers and peasants, especially the youth. It also recruits from the ranks of the petty bourgeois intelligentsia, local party branches and mass organizations, both in the rural areas and cities, have clear plans and methods for deploying their members to the NPA. The NPA builds itself both vertically and horizontally, striking the correct balance between the two. It builds and integrates the three types of NPA formations in every guerrilla front, sub-region and sub-region. The NPA platoons for mass work, or armed propaganda units. The guerrilla platoons to, unders to undersize company guerrilla units at the sub-regional and regional level that serve as centers of gravity of guerrilla warfare in their area and which also bears the basic elements of mobile guerrilla warfare and the local guerrilla militia units and sub-defense militia units of mass organizations. The NPA builds its armed strength and develops appropriate weapons to fight the enemy. It relies mainly on seizing rifles and other weapons from the enemy. It combines the use of high-powered weapons with indigenous or low-powered weapons including homemade handguns, as well as develops command detonated and handheld explosives or grenades from available materials. These weapons are made in large numbers for wide use among the Red Fighters and militia units. The NPA trains to use its rifles or develop weapons against enemy aircraft. Over the past six years, the NPA has successfully frustrated the enemy's brutal and large-scale strategic offensives and its declarations of ending the armed revolution before the end of the term of the U.S. Duterte regime. It has preserved its forces by persevering along the path of protracted people's war and by resolutely advancing the Filipino people's struggle for genuine national independence and democracy. NPA units have successfully mastered the tactics of counter encirclement through dispersal and quick movement of smaller units to penetrate through the gaps of enemy forces on the rough terrain of the countryside in order to strike at the weak points of the enemy on its flanks and rear. They have successfully compelled the enemy to overstretch his forces by expanding the NPA's areas of operation to cover six to ten towns while maintaining close leadership of the masses and mounting armed actions across the breadth of its territory. Units of the NPA are strictly observing military discipline and security policies and further developing guerrilla methods of secrecy and maneuvering and encampment in order to render ineffective the enemy's use of drones, satellite trackers and electronic signals combined with ground intelligence forces for surveillance and target acquisitions and thus denying the enemy of an opportunity to use their aerial assets to drop bombs and strafing in, air, in areas within the enemy's focus and villages under military occupation, the NPA and the masses are successfully standing firm, parrying the enemy's attacks 
mounting counterattacks and defending themselves. The masses are inspired by the slogan, don't be cowed into silence, and are fighting back through armed and unarmed forms of resistance. They have driven away military detachments from their communities. The NPA raises the level of cultural activity within its ranks and among the masses. Red fighters and commanders are taught and encouraged to express their experiences, the oppression and aspirations of the masses, contempt for the enemy, and propagation of revolutionary ideas in various creative forms, which in turn can help raise and strengthen the revolutionary will of their fellow fighters and the masses. The cultural influences of the ruling system that poison the minds of the youth are rejected and the national scientific and mass culture is promoted. The masses are the source of strength of the NPA. The NPA therefore always aims to strengthen the ties that bind it with the masses. It mobilizes the masses and their millions. It defends and supports the agrarian revolution. The mass struggles against all forms of feudal oppression are combined with their struggles against imperialism and fascism. The number of organized masses run in the millions and support the CPP, NPA, NDFP, and the People's Democratic Government. The NPA and all other revolutionary forces work hard to carry out widespread propaganda, agitation, mobilization of the masses. They carry out all forms of propaganda to effectively reach the people and their areas of operation. They distribute actively and widely Dyang Bayan, other revolutionary publications and statements of the CPP, NPA, and NDFP at the national and regional levels to clarify the stand and views of the revolutionary movement on the outstanding issues confronting the country and people in the regions. Local NPA units produce and distribute leaflets and local newsletters to present analysis of local issues and problems of the people to raise their consciousness and militancy to fight for their rights and interests. They always conduct social investigation and gather the facts and the pressing problems of the masses in their villages and towns. They can produce local radio or video programs. They can link up with the youth and the masses in their areas in various ways. They also exert efforts to work with media outfits to serve as a platform for reaching out to the people. The NPA resolutely and vigorously expose and oppose the lies and disinformation being spread by the enemy. It uses all means to gather all facts and proofs to express the truth. The units of the NPA conduct campaigns of mass education and mass organizing, raising production, public health and sanitation, self-defense, disaster relief and environmental protection. The NPA has excellent work in combating the COVID-19 pandemic as well as other diseases endemic in the local area. They mount mass clinics and provide health services to the masses. The NPA vigorously develops a revolutionary cultural movement among the masses by promoting revolutionary songs, poems, dances, dramatic acts, skits and other works of art. It organizes local choral or dance troops of youth and children and mount intervillage or intertown festivals to promote the local revolutionary culture. The NPA also teaches the masses the use of tactics to turn the reactionary law against their oppressors. They can make use of various forms of organization and mobilization to draw the biggest participation of a community and apply the United Front policy and tactics to rely on the basic masses and take advantage of splits among the enemy. The party, the NDFP and various mass organizations encourage the broad masses in the cities to join or support the revolutionary armed struggle in the countryside. Extra efforts are being exerted to carry out education and propaganda among the masses who are daily exposed to the lies of the enemy through mass media and social media. The connections and interactions of exploitation and oppression of the peasant masses are being exposed and related to the problems of workers' 
and the unemployed, students, urban poor, professionals, ordinary employees, and other oppressed sectors. The masses in the cities are inspired to wage militant collective struggle to defend their rights and welfare, fight political repression under the fascist regime, and resist imperialist domination and military intervention. They issue timely slogans and calls to urge the masses to mount protest actions in their factories and work workplaces, in school campuses and communities, and to take to the streets and demonstrate in big numbers to denounce the oppressive economic policies, mendicancy of the ruling regimes, all-out liberalization, tax burdens, low wages, and low salaries, skyrocketing of prices of food and fuel, tuition increases, and rising costs of other services. Party branches and committees and the underground revolutionary sectoral organizations allied with the NDAP are being built in the cities. These organizations have millions of members and perform their role in propaganda and education to raise the revolutionary consciousness of the people in the cities. They expose and oppose the terrorist designation against the CPP, NPA, and NDAP, which the fascists use as pretext for state terrorism and the U.S. imperialists to use as pretext for military intervention. They have encouraged the masses in the cities to join the NPA in the countryside, facilitated integration and coordination, and helped generate political and material support for the revolutionary armed struggle. They have helped ensure the safety of activists and mass leaders who are subjected to fascist persecution or threats of arrest or murder, and facilitate their transfer to the countryside to avail of the protection of the NPA and to become ever more active and effective fighters for national and social liberation. Revolutionary propaganda has been addressed specifically to the rank and file foot soldiers of the enemy who come from the toiling masses and are used as cannon fodder in the enemy's brutal counterinsurgency operations. They are urged to leave the reactionary military and police and to join their class brothers and sisters in fighting for the just cause of the oppressed and exploited. They call upon them to expose their knowledge of the crimes, corruption, and high living of the officers of the AFP and to bring the weapons to the side of the revolution. The CPP, NP, and NDAFP, as well as other revolutionary mass organizations, have had an outstanding record of being able to win over enemy officers, cadets, and enlisted personnel to the revolutionary side. The disintegration of the enemy forces is complementary to the annihilation of enemy forces in the battlefield and is accomplished by prudent and persuasive methods outside of the battlefield, acceptance of enemy surrenders and lenient treatment to those who surrender. The youth are called upon by the people and the revolutionary forces to shun the reactionary armed forces and police, no matter the promises of high salaries by exposing the AFP and PNP as enemies of the people and exposing their crimes against the people. They are persuaded by their friends and relatives to leave the military, police and paramilitary academies and training programs and not to become oppressors of the people. In addition to the more than 10 million Filipinos who stay unemployed in the Philippines, another more than 10 million have left the country as cheap labor abroad since the late 1970s. There are more than 10% of the Philippine population and more than 20% of the Philippine labor force. Efforts are being intensified to inform the migrant Filipinos and the peoples around the world about the ever worsening conditions of oppression and exploitation in the Philippines and the justice of the revolutionary armed struggle for national and social liberation from U.S. imperialism and the local exploiting classes. We strive to gain international support under the principles of anti-imperialist solidarity and proletarian internationalism through solidarity mass work, partnerships of Filipino progressive organizations,
with their counterparts abroad and through proto-diplomatic and diplomatic relations with governments that are anti-imperialist and assertive of national independence and socialist programs or aspirations. In this regard, we appreciate highly and are grateful for the international solidarity work and cooperation of the International League of People's Struggle and the various organizations of Bayan, the leading federation of patriotic and democratic organizations, and likewise the Friends of the Filipino People in a Struggle and the National Democratic Front of the Philippines. They have achieved a lot in their work and cooperative relations. They have strengthened themselves and extended support to the Filipino people in their struggle. They have also been supportive whenever the GRP and the FP peace negotiations are held abroad to address the roots of the civil war in the Philippines. In view of the red tagging by the forces of imperialist and state terrorism in the Philippines, we must point out that both Bayan and NDRP are for the noble and just principles of national independence and democracy, but they cannot be equated with each other because Bayan is a legal federation of patriotic and democratic forces and the NDRP is the National United Front for People's Democratic Revolution and for the People's Democratic Government. Overseas Filipinos and their foreign friends have found more freedom to relate openly to either one or both of Bayan and NDRP than Filipinos who are subjected to state terrorism in the Philippines. Thank you.